Am I on? It's coming? There we go. I'm going to keep having these interruptions. No, I'm kidding. Good morning. Good morning. Great to have you all this morning in the house of the Lord. Don't know how stuffed animals get up on here. I'm a Beanie Baby fan. Just kidding. No, I'm not. Not, e not even on a good day. I'm mourning this week. I know. I know the Stars lost. They're not out of the Stanley Cup payoffs. I will not be playing, praying against the St. Louis Blues. If I can do that, you know. Funnier when you laugh. Man. It's a dead crowd this morning. Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. Exodus chapter 1, verse 15. <coughs> then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whose name was Sephora and the other whose name was Pua, when you serve as midwives to the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stools. If it is a son, you shall kill him. If it is a daughter, you shall let live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said, Why have you done this? And let the male children live. And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. For they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes. I always find that verse very humorous. I just, I just snicker there. So God dealt with the midwives, or dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. Because the midwives feared God and gave, he gave them families, then Pharaoh commanded all of his people and said that every born, or sorry, every son born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but every daughter you shall let live. All right. We pick up here. You saw last week how Pharaoh begins to fear the children of Israel and has decided the way to get rid of them is I'll make them slaves. And in so enslaving them, then I can kind of control what they do and we can kind of get some free labor out of this and we can build these pyramids because we have millions of Hebrew people to build them. It's not really the conversation, but work with me. But what was the greatest fear he had? They were terrified of their number and perhaps that if an invading army comes in, they'll side with the invading army and take their wealth and leave. So Pharaoh comes up with his version of the final solution. We know the final solution from the Nazi death camps. It was a way to exterminate the vermin races. So Pharaoh says, ah, got a great idea. And he tries to elicit the help of individuals to help carry out this wicked action. Let's take a look at the passage. Then the king of Egypt said to the midwives, the Hebrew midwives, one of whom is Sephora and the other one Puam, when you serve as midwives to the Hebrew women, we'll stop right there. Are there only two? Well, mathematically, when you start calculating, it is like these are some busy women. I mean, these ladies are like, they're everywhere. They're like, well, I won't get into that. More than likely, these ladies represent the midwife class, if you will. They are the representation of the midwives. Now, also within the text, you have this argument of, well, when he addresses the Hebrew midwives, is he saying that they are Hebrews who happen to be midwives to the Hebrews, or are they Egyptian women who are midwives to the Hebrews? Because you can word the passage the same way, either way. And the reason why some think, well, it's Egyptian women, because Pharaoh says, do what? Kill babies. And many Egyptian women are probably a little bit more amenial to that activity. I tend to think that it's Hebrew women who are serving as midwives to Hebrew women, because Pharaoh, being a bit of a narcissist, because he is a living God, 
would never think of anyone refusing to obey a command from a living God. When you see it's a boy, kill it. Notice what he's trying to do. He's trying to exterminate a race and get that own race to help exterminate itself. Very interesting. Very interesting. The, the plan is very eugenic in its nature. And you say, well, what is eugenics? Well, eugenics is a, is a belief system that kind of helps weed out the undesirables. One of the main proponents of it in our world... In, uh, in America, is a woman by the name of Margaret Sanger. Now, we have a presidential candidate who says that Margaret Sanger was one of her most influential individuals in her lifetime. Margaret Sanger believed that African Americans were human weeds and should be weeded out. This is what she says about how uh, we should control the populace. This comes from her speech, The Morality of Birth Control, in 1921. She divides society into three groups, an edu uh, the educated and informed class that regulates the size of its families, the intelligent and the responsible who desire to control their families in spite of lacking the means and knowledge, the irresponsible and the reckless whose religious scruples, I want you to hear this, the irresponsible and the reckless whose religious scruples prevent their, that would be you guys. And, and me, and Stephanie. You fit in that class because of your religious scruples. Prevent their exercising control over their numbers. Singer concluded there is no doubt in the mind of all thinking people, not you people, that procreation of this group should be stopped by government means. This is eugenics. The killing of the young, the killing of the old, because they are no longer viable. I love this argument of viability. Well, you know, let's, as long until a baby is viable, I can take your four-year-old, lock him in a house with food and water, and leave him a can opener on the counter. I guarantee you, there's a good chance I'll come home, and your four-year-old is not well-fed. Is that viability? See, the viability argument really doesn't work. We'll get into more of this. This is Margaret Singer's approach. And the Nazis utilized a great deal of the eugenics movement from the United States to build their final solution. And these are the individuals that shape one of our presidential candidates. Thinking. That's horrific. Notice what happens here in this text. What is one of the key parts of the passage in this text? Notice what it says. The midwives, what? Feared God. Feared God. Now, Pharaoh is the most powerful man that exists in their world. And pretty much all the way up to the Fertile Crescent, he's the man. Okay? And all the way down into the land of Cush, he's the man. He's like the sole superpower in that region. He, if he says the sky is blue, remember, he's the living God, it's blue. But if he says it's bright pink, no one to his face is going to say, I think it's blue. And that's usually a great way of not influencing friends and, and family. And so notice what they do. Notice the command. As you're giving birth... When the midwives is on the stool, and there's a lot of textual problems with this, and, and some of it a little more graphic than what we have. We have kids in here, so we won't get into that. But essentially, as the child is being born, whether on a stool or, or whatever else it could mean, if you look, kill the male. This is your first recorded event of a partial birth abortion. This is also your first recorded event of a post-birth abortion, up which we have individuals pushing that are running for office. When they're there, kill them. Well, why kill the males? I mean, if you really want to eliminate procreation, you would figure they would kill the females, right? Just kill the females. It's easier. Because now you've got all this male workforce that can do a lot of stuff and help build your, 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 your pyramids. And, you know, because you've got millions of Hebrew slaves, it'd be helpful if they were all male. Unless, of course, your greatest fear is that they side with an invading army and take over. 
Then you kill the males because then you don't have a warrior class. And it's not the Amazon folks, so, you know. Well, I can't believe he said that. Girls can fight too. Not in this day and age. Sorry. It's called backwards causation history. We don't do that here. So you don't have a warrior class. You still get free labor because they're going to work the stuff into all those girls. But you also have the opportunity for your, Hebrew, or for your Egyptian men to have another wife to make more Egyptians. It's really kind of the general thinking of what's going on here. But you have a uh, dilemma here with the text. I, the most powerful man in your world, have given you not a suggestion, but I have given you a command. I have told you when you see a male child, you are to kill it. You and all the midwives. If I don't kill the child, what is the implied statement? You will be killed. I now have a dilemma. We, we use this terminology today in America. We, we, we use this phrase, well, you have an issue of the lesser of two evils. Because one is, I kill the child and I live, or I don't kill the child and I run the chance of dying. And they don't stop at just disobeying. They go one step further. Notice what it says here. Let's take a look at what the text says here. The women feared the Lord and did not do as the king commanded, but let the male children live. Kill the babies or I kill you. We're not killing the babies, so we have to have a reason to not be our fault that the babies live. This is the part I love. Pharaoh asked, why do you let the male children live? Well, because Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous or spirited is another way you could translate that. And by the time we get there, baby's gone and up and walking. <laughs> Wait, man, you know, they call for the midwife, and by the time I show up, well, I can't tell which, which woman has just had a baby. Well, I've been in the operating room when both girls were born. I've been in a, the labor room as well. I will tell you this. This is a little rabbit. That's why the rabbit's there. My, my first time we were there, I had just gotten back from Iraq. My sleep cycle was still on Iraqi time. And so while Steph is sitting in a chair, I am zonked out in the bed. <laughs> Dead to the world. There's a picture of us with Caroline, Steph's big, big face, Caroline, and I look like I have like doped up on all kinds of. <laughs> However, at moments of great pain, when when she had, oh, everyone in the room was wide awake and fully cognizant that there was a child being born. Hebrew women are so vigorous that out comes the baby, cord cut, kids running around. I can't tell which one's done. You got to be pretty slow. <laughs> you got to be pretty slow to grab this. I mean, maybe Pharaoh's not the sharpest knife in the box. But they lie. They lie. Is that really the case? Oh, I'm sure there's some women that, man, their child could come out sideways and not cry or nothing. Planes, trains, and automobiles, that's where it comes from. Don't blame me. Babies come out sideways crying or nothing. I'm sure there are women like that. But on the whole, they don't, dam it, they don't, they don't make medication painkillers just for giggles. Right, ladies? And Pharaoh kind of believes this. Going back to the concept of abortion here, he's asked them to create or actually commit what we call a partial birth abortion. One of the greatest scourges in American history is the fact that we have allowed a holocaust to continue. And a lot of times we think nothing of it. We have killed more babies than Hitler could ever have imagined. 
and we don't think anything of it. <sighs> of all the denominations that have been pro-life, we are a Johnny-come-lately to this party. As a matter of fact, before the 70s, the Catholic denomination was the only one really leading this charge. They were the only one leading this charge. Baptists, well, you know, we're, we've always been pro-life. And I've, I've asked people throughout the week, you know, when did Baptists become pro-life? And I always got this look like, haven't we always been? No, we haven't. To our undying shame, we have not. We didn't really become pro-life fully as a denomination until 1987. In 1971, we tried to put an amendment into our conference that we go to, the convention that we attend, and it failed miserably. 1978, according to the Baptist Press, I got the article from January 5th, 2015, there was a full-page ad in the St. Louis newspaper of denominations that were pro-life, and guess whose names were there? Southern Baptist Convention. The lawyer that helped represent the woman responsible for the start of this holocaust was a Southern Baptist lawyer who said, I'm glad that we now have this law changed so that women have access to this right. What changed in 1981, several individuals began to push for a very pro-life agenda. It took 20 measures from 81 to 87 before that changed the Southern Baptist in one direction. If you were born in the early 80s and past, this is probably news to you. Dr. W.A. Criswell, the founder of my college that I attended, was pro-choice for a long time. He believed that the child was not viable until he was out or she was outside of the womb, and then it was viable, even though he believed that it was a life form in the mother's womb, but until it was viable, it could be killed. He reversed his policy, but he reversed, he flip-flopped on his policy in the 70s. As more and more information came out on the fact that this was actually a life form and not a clump of cells. And when his finally his, his uh, study Bible came out, the Crystal Study Bible, by 7980, he had definitely taken a pro-life stance. See, we are Johnny come lately to this argument. We still wrestled with it. I remember the church I attended, there was this big issue on whether or not you should have abortions or not. And one of the things that we kind of harmonized on, well, in rape, incest, murder, or deformity. So you have a deformed child, yes. So you think it's okay to kill a deformed child, yes. Why? Well, quality of life. Well, I think you're a deformed human. Can I kill you? Well, no. Well, my quality of life will go up. You're a deformed person voting. <laughs> Same argument. Just proximity to the womb is what changes it. Well, rape, murder, and incest. And I got into this in the captain's career course because I was a huge fan of folks there. I, I was, once I found out I was a non-select the first time around, the worst they could do is bend my dog tax and send me back to Iraq. And I've been there and I got the shirt multiple times. So I really had no fear of the instructors in the class and they knew it. So we all had this nice little peaceful thing. And so we were here in an, ethic, in an ethics class with chaplains. And the NCO teaching the ethics class to chaplains brought up this whole thing. Well, what about rape, murder, and incest? What about it? Well, would you make that woman carry a baby to term? So well, let me ask you this question. Because a violent act is committed against me, does that give me the right to commit another violent act against another person? Does it justify killing another life form because something violent happened to me. 
The answer is absolutely not. It's still a life form. Well, what if she doesn't want to keep the baby? I know a ton of folks that would love to have babies. What about in defense of the, mother, the woman's, the, the mother's life? You know, the baby's going to kill the mom, or the mom's going to kill the baby. See Everett Coop. Know who he is? Used to be Surgeon General of the United States. Said so he's never seen an instance where that has ever happened. That's a back door to kill babies. We said debate continues to roll on. Well, I don't think that's the case. You're inconsistent in your position. Kill all the males. This is a genocidal command. This is a genocidal act. And it is one which they refuse to act. Why? They fear whom? Folks, when it comes to this argument, whom should you fear? Yet we don't. Because it is justified or seen in whether or not this is still on the books. Remember, we're the largest voting population as evangelical Americans. And this policy hasn't changed. When you see the child, kill it. Now notice, you have here this quandary. The, you've got this issue, you've got this dilemma. If I kill the child, I live... If I, or sorry, if I, if I kill the child, I live, but if I don't kill the child, I die. But then I compound it by saying, Hebrew women are so vigorous. So not only do they do the lesser of two evils, they then lie to help aid that. Well, now you got a problem with the text. Well, actually, it's not a textual problem. It's an understanding problem. The Hebrew women are not like us, or like Egyptian women. So check this out. Verse 20. So God dealt horribly, painfully with the midwives because they lied and didn't obey the word of the king. It's not there. God dealt well with the midwives. Now, Augustine or Augustine, depending on how you look at it, I had a professor who said, Augustine is a grass, Augustine is a man. I went, <laughs> that's cute. Augustine goes, God rewards them for the kindness that they show to the Hebrew women, but he's not rewarding them for the lie. The problem is the lie is wrapped up in the kindness that they show to the Hebrew women. You're trying to split a very fine hair, and I don't think you do. You have this problem in other passages. We see this if you were here on Sunday nights with David and the priest of Nob. David tells a whopper to the high priest, I've been sent for the king on a special mission, and I was in such a hurry. By gosh, I left all my food, water, and my weaponry at home. <laughs> Man, <laughs> must have been going out of the side of the palace and into the heat of... Just the AC just messed with my head. But he says it in the hopes that he's protecting the priest at Nam because they give him aid and comfort. It doesn't work in this case. It doesn't work in this case with the Hebrew women. Saul comes and kills all the priests at Nam, all 84 of them. You see this with Rahab the harlot. Are the spies here? Nope. They're not here at all. Technically, she's right. They weren't technically in the room with her. They were on the roof. We see this in the event of Nazi Germany. And I know, and I've had people that have argued this. I've been in part of a conversation with individuals, and I've looked at them since you are a moron. I would have told the Nazis that the Jews were in the attic and trusted that God would save me. You're a moron. You have Jews who you know, if the Nazis catch them, they will kill them. And now they will kill you. And what happens is, a lot of times, we have ideas 
where we, we take an ideology and we approach it to the point where we have such a, an ivory tower thinking with no practicality. And we think because it's a very ivory tower and very aloof that somehow this is, this is what works. But yet I have biblical examples here where in many cases people would have said, the Hebrew women, man, they shoot them babies right out of the womb. They run them by the time they hit the ground. There are no, there are no spies in this, in this house. Well, the great story is about Athanasius, and he's a great theologian from the 300s. He was at the Council of Nicaea. He had been excommunicated, or not actually excommunicated, he was put under ban. And so he was fleeing for his life, and his, his detractors were chasing him. And they were on a river, I forget which river it is, but the fog had shrouded his boat for a little bit. And as the boat pursuing them catches up, they go, Have you seen this man? And he yells back, Yes! He's in front of you! And they sail right on past him. Because the implied statement is, Where is, where is Athanasius? He's up ahead in front of us. And they took it and moved on. You have this what do we do here? I'm presented with two evils. I'm presented with a dilemma. I'm presented with two problems. I kill the babies or I run the chance of getting killed. I let the babies live and I could die. And now I've compounded it with a lie. And then you had the text that compounds it more by saying God blesses them, causes their house to grow. It's not a justification for lying for lying's sake. But I think if you look at these examples, that you have a good example that in the case of defensive life, when you have an illegal order or an immoral order from a king, as you do here with Pharaoh, then the people are not obligated to follow that immoral order from the king. Kill all baby children. I fear the Lord more than I fear the king, and I fear the Lord more than I fear the king's wrath, and I'm willing to accept the king's uh, wrath and responsibility, but I fear the Lord over the king. Therefore, I will let the children live. I fear the Lord who these people represent as they've come up out of Egypt because I've heard the stories of their deliverance over Pharaoh's army. And I fear that God over the civil authorities of this city. So I will say that there are no spies here. It doesn't stop it. Phase three of the final solution. Verse 22. Then Pharaoh commanded all of his people, Every son born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but every daughter you shall let live. Oh, the babies come out hitting the ground running? Great. Too easy. We'll fix that problem. Every male child is thrown into the Nile. Now, one of the reasons behind this, instead of just taking the children and stabbing them or taking the children and, 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 and you know, finding cool ways of killing them, as Herod does as he pursues Jesus, Pharaoh tosses them into the river. And one of the things about this is that the belief is, well, they had a very simplistic way of living then. Pharaoh doesn't kill the children if he throws them into the river with the river god, because if the river god wants to save the Hebrew children, he, he will. So technically, Pharaoh doesn't kill them the river god kills them, though Pharaoh gives the order, and the people toss the babies in. It's kind of like there's a pie sitting right there. And I go, I'm going to walk this way going, um, 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 um. And if the pie doesn't move, and I eat it, it's the pie's fault. Or, I do this one, and I've heard prayers kind of like this. Lord, if you do not want me to be a missionary to the Congo, give me absolutely no sign. Thy will be done. It's very simplistic. Yet the problem with that simplistic thinking is, who put the babies in the river? The Egyptian king did. Not personally, he's not out there like going, let's see if I make it skip. 
But he orders the men to toss them in. And you go, this is tragic. This is a genocide. And it is. Remember, going back to Genesis chapter 15. You'll be a sojourner. You'll be a slave. I'm going to let you be oppressed. Then I'm going to crush the kingdom that afflicts you. I'm going to raise up, well, he doesn't say to deliver, but you will leave with their wealth. In the book of Judges, it kind of follows a similar thing and talks about raising up a judge. Break car. And then I'm going to use you to crush the Ammonites. The means by which Pharaoh is attempting to destroy the people of Israel is going to be the means by which he brings around their deliverer. If the babies don't go into the river, if Pharaoh orders them to be stabbed in the heart or disembodied, Moses is in trouble. But notice that the avenue for which Moses can get in to the, into the Pharaoh's household and be educated and taught and put in a position where he can have a greater impact is to go where? Into the river. The means by which is to be brought about to destroy the nation of Israel is the very means that God is going to utilize to bring about their deliverance. A lot of times we look at situations like this and we have, as we've talked about, the snippet we have and go, this is horrific evil. Instead of the overarching understanding of God, where it says, while this means is evil, and it's going to be utilized by me to bring about your deliverance. You see this with the story of Joseph. What you had intended to be an evil action, God intended slash cause, the phraseology is there. God caused it to work for good to save many alive. Joseph being betrayed and sold into slavery was definitely an evil act. But in the grand scheme of God's plans, raise the children of Israel here. Joseph becomes second most powerful in the land. Children of Israel go into slavery. Moses is arisen. Children of Israel get their own homeland. And God's power is seen as they decimate the Egyptians without a sink, firing a single arrow. I haven't seen the movie uh, Gods and Kings or Gods and Generals. Apparently in that movie, Moses is a freedom fighter and insurgent. Guys, I've read through the book of Exodus. I, I don't really see it myself. That goes back to where your theology comes from. Look at what happens. I'm going to try to destroy them through physical labor. That doesn't work. I now am going to try to destroy them by getting people to collude with me to kill the babies. That doesn't work. I now am going to toss the male children into the river to destroy them. But what ends up happening is a deliverer is brought out. What happens is we get so focused on the misery that we lose sight of the hope. Genesis chapter 15 tells them that there is the hope. Wonder, slavery, oppression going to crush the people that did this to you and you're going to leave with their wealth and you're going to go into a land that I'm going to show you and you're going to crush the people that are there. You're going to move into turnkey homes because they're not going to need them. But what happens is we focus on the misery. Our attention is right there. And yet in the midst of our misery is the means by which our deliverance typically comes. Have you ever noticed that about us? Have you ever noticed that that is usually where we place our focus? The disciples did it. Jesus is asleep in a boat. That should be your number one sign. When the Lord and Master, as John says, the man who created all that is and exists, is sleeping, sopping wet in the middle of a boat, not doing this, doing this. 
That's why I don't do cruises. I just don't. That and every time I see one on TV, when we were in Italy, one turned over in the middle of the ocean, dry outside the port. And I don't know how you do that, but they did it. And then everybody comes off of them sick. But imagine you're in a boat that's rocking and rolling like that, and while everybody else is terrified, the Lord and Master is asleep. Why? Where was their focus? On the external and the storm around them. Where was not their focus? On the Lord and Savior in the boat who's asleep. We get so tied up looking at the pain and the misery and the hor horrificness of the event here in the book of Exodus that we do not look to see that our deliverer is coming possibly by the exact same means. That's what happens here. The same water Pharaoh orders the children to be thrown into is the exact same water Moses is going to be drawn out of. I find that very interesting. Notice also that the last plague, the murder of every one male child of the Egyptian household, of the firstborn, is very similar to the command that Pharaoh gives here. You want to go tit for tat with God? Fine. He got him. What do you have? When we pull away, so what? So what? So what? A couple things. There's an obligation when there is a command that is given that is illegal, immoral, and ungodly. We find from the text that the people refuse to follow it. You have an obligation where the midwives didn't cease to follow it because it aligned with their political needs, didn't cease to follow it because it aligned with their social identical theological thinking, didn't cease to follow it because they thought it was a cool idea, they didn't follow it for one reason, the text mentions it twice, they what? Feared God and refused the order. You see this just this past week. We have a president that has sent an order out to all Texas schools, and you had Lieutenant Governor go, yeah, okay, whatever. Why? That's an immoral command. Let them keep their money. You see this as Pharaoh then ratchets up the violence from slavery to the murder of a child to just fatly kill them. This doesn't catch God off surprise. And God wasn't having a, well, I didn't see that part of the plan happening. No, it's actually very integral to the plan because what he is going to do is that child is going to go into the water and going to be drawn out by Pharaoh's daughter and utilized to set free the people. Where do you put your focus in your life? Do you focus in upon, this is the worst thing ever. Do you focus in on, I'll follow this command because if I don't, I have much to risk. See, the focus is still the same. Do I trust God enough to follow him in the midst of all of this? Do I trust God enough to where I can refuse an illegal order and know that my family will be safe? And even if not, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego go, even if not, we still will not bend the knee. Or do we just simply go, well, it's not that big of an issue for me. Overall speaking, it's not that big of an issue for me at all. Oh, sure, I may say something about it, but pff, nah. I'll just go along to get along. Do we focus in on the part of the pain and yet not focus in upon the master who is bringing deliverance? Where's your focus? In both cases, your focus, if you're focusing on doing it and getting along to get along or focusing in on only the pain, you are ceasing to rely solely upon a sovereign Lord who sees the beginning from the end and has already prepared the means of deliverance for the Israel people. Where's your focus when you come to issues like this? This morning, we're going to have two baptisms. If they'll go ahead and Head back that way now. That'd be great. These individuals have...
recognized that they have placed their hope in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who has not and does not abandon his own, but yet as they come, they come to follow him in an act of obedience for believers' baptism, to signify that they have died to the sin of their past and that the old flesh, as Paul says in Philippians, has been cut away and the new flesh has been put on. As the praise band comes and leads us in singing, if you'll take a moment to think about that. <laughs> 